In this video, we're going to talk about Haas's theorem for elliptic curves over finite fields. Although this video is about Haas's theorem, before we get into it, let's just do a little bit of cleanup from last time. Python has a set of style conventions, which is called PEP8. And last time I was using camel case, but we should really be using snake case. So I just want to make those changes. I'll do that off camera because it's not too interesting. So these are the function names we have to change. We're not changing any logic or anything. We're just changing the names from camel case to snake case. But the class name of elliptic curve is in camel case, but that's consistent with PEP8, so we're going to leave that as it is. All right, so what is Haas's theorem? It's an estimate on the number of points on the elliptic curve. So we fix a prime P, and we consider an elliptic curve E over the field FP. So in the background, there's values A and B, because we need those values A and B to define the curve. We don't need to mention them, we just implicitly know that they exist. And if we take such a curve, so and when we say that, we mean that the discriminant is non-zero, that's given. And there's an estimate on the number of points in E. We use the symbol pound E or hash sign E to indicate the cardinality of that set, the number of points that are in there. And that does include the infinity point. And this, what does this say? When, when we write the absolute value of a difference, the absolute value of x minus y, it kind of means the distance between x and y, right? Without regard to sign. So when we write the absolute value of the number of points in E minus P plus one, that's kind of a statement about the differing, the distance between those two quantities. It's, uh, and it, what the theorem says is that it's bounded above by two root P. So the number of points in E and compared to P plus one, they're no more than two root P apart. So let's try to unravel this a little bit and understand what it means. So although in these videos, we're only dealing with the finite field FP, you can also have finite fields where the value Q, there is a power of a prime. The size of the field is a power of a prime. And we call those fields FQ. And Haas's theorem still holds for elliptic curves over those fields. But we're not, we're not going to talk about that in this video or in these videos. But I just wanted to mention that Haas's theorem still holds in that more general case. But for us, we're just looking at the case of FP. Now just remember, when we write the absolute value of X is less than or equal to A, that's just the same thing as saying X is between minus A and A. And so in the above inequality here, the absolute value of this difference is being less than or equal to two root P means that minus two root P is less than or equal to that difference is less than or equal to two root P. And then if we just add P plus one everywhere, we obtain a, a bound, an upper and a lower bound for the number of points in E. So P plus one minus two root P is less than or equal to the points in E, and that's less than or equal to P plus one plus two root P. So the number of points in E is always trapped between those two bounds, the lower bound and the upper bound. And that's true for any elliptic curve over FP, no matter what A and B are. Now we can maybe rewrite Haas's theorem a little bit. If we define epsilon to be the number of points in E minus P plus one, that's an integer, it could be negative. We could just say, we can express Haas's theorem as just the number of points in E is P plus one plus epsilon, where epsilon is some integer whose absolute value is less than or equal to two root P. That's an obvious rephrasing of what we talked about, the way we stated it before. Um, just notice that when we have a very large prime, for example, when we do the root of it, it becomes much smaller, right? So two root P is much smaller than P. 
And when we write epsilon, the notation is a little bit suggestive that it's small, right? So the, when we write it like this, it's kind of suggesting that the number of points in E is P plus one. Essentially, the number of points in the elliptic curve is P plus one. But there will be an error term, which is the epsilon, and that could make the number of points be a little bit more than P plus one or a little bit less than P plus one, depending if epsilon's positive or negative. Let's just do a numerical example to get this more concrete. So if P is the prime 101, then epsilon 2 root P would be around 20.1. And that's kind of our error term. 101 plus 1, P plus 1, that's, that's 102. So basically it's 102 minus 20.1 and 102 plus 20.1. That's the lower and upper bound for the possibilities of the sizes of elliptic curves. Now, since the size of the elliptic curve is an integer, and it's between these two decimal values, we can actually take the ceiling of the lower bound. So 81.9, when we take the ceiling of that, we get 82. And then we can take the floor of the upper bound, 122.1. When we take the floor of that, we get 122. So any elliptic curve over the field of 101 elements, that's a 101's prime, right? Then the points in E, the number of elements of E, is always between 82 and 122. You know, there are many, many elliptic curves over F101. You could print them all out with the code we have right now. But no matter what, every time the cardinality is always between 82 and 122. All right, so let's go a little further now. By Haas's theorem, we know that for any elliptic curve over FP, its cardinality is trapped between these two upper and lower bounds. The next question might be is if we take any integer in that range, which satisfies this, these inequalities, does there an, exist an elliptic curve whose cardinality is that given integer? And that's actually true. So if we take the any integer between these two real numbers, p plus one minus two root p, and p plus 1 plus 2 root p, take any positive integer in that range, there does exist some elliptic curve whose cardinality is n. And we will check that in code in a moment. So what does that mean in the previous example? Remember, our lower bound was 82 and our upper bound is 122. If we take any positive integer in that range, including 82 and 122, then necessarily there exists some A and B in F101 whose discriminant is non-zero and the corresponding elliptic curve has exactly N points, including the infinity point. So Python's code to verify Haas's theorem will be very easy. Just uh, We can just write it like this. We already have a function for the number of points. We'll call that. And then we subtract that from P plus one, take the absolute value of that. And we want to make sure that it's less than or equal to two times math dot square root p. We'll have to remember to import the math module. All right, this is our code from last time. I made those changes off screen there where we changed the casing type. We went from camel case to snake case. Let's delete our little experiment from before. So we can imp implement the verify Hasa function just like we wrote down on the slide there. We just take the number of points that function we wrote before. We can see it on the screen there. It's just above. And then subtract it from p plus 1. We put brackets around the p plus 1. Take the absolute value of all of that. And we would like that to be less than or equal to 2 times the math dot square root p. And then we'll just remember the important math. And then we just return whether that's true or false. We expect that whenever the discriminant is non-zero, which means we have an elliptic curve, that should always return true. That's the content of Hasse's theorem. So let's do a little experiment. Let's take that prime we took before, 101. Let's make up some numbers A and B. Now, since I just made those up randomly, I'm not totally sure if this is an elliptic curve or not. The way we know is let's test if the discriminant is non-zero or not. So if the discriminant is zero, 
then it's not an elliptic curve and we shouldn't expect Haas's theorem to hold necessarily. So why don't we just try to print out to see if the discriminant is non-zero, it's true, good. And is it true that Haas's theorem holds? It is true as well, good. So that's one small piece of evidence of verification of Haas's theorem. Now let's define the lower and upper bound that we figured out before. And we can write it directly, p plus one minus two square root p, but why don't we use that epsilon notation? I kind of like that. So separately, we'll define epsilon to be two times the square root of p. That's a floating point number, right? It's not an integer. And we'll define the lower bound to be p plus one minus epsilon, and then we'll take the ceiling of that. That's the lower bound. And p plus one plus epsilon, that'll be the upper bound. And we'll take the floor of that. We can print those quantities off. We can print off the, the lower bound and the upper bound just to see what they are for the given prime. And we see that indeed the number of points, which is 110, does lie between 82 and 122. So Hasse theorem is being verified for this particular curve. Let's take this a little bit further now. Instead of restricting ourselves to looking at one particular curve for A and B, why don't we just range over every possibility? So let's let A and B go from zero to P and we'll construct the curve according to A and B and P. Let's call it EC. We need to test that the discriminant is non-zero. If it is zero, we're just gonna to continue to the next value. But if it is non-zero, then great, we've discovered an elliptic curve. And why don't we just make a big list of every possible order of an elliptic curve? So that's what I call group orders there. It initially starts as an empty list. But as we loop through all the possible elliptic curves, every time we discover one, we remember how many points it has. We call EC dot number of points and throw that into the list. So now we have a list of all possible orders of every elliptic curve for a fixed prime P. In this case, it's 101. And while we're in that loop, why don't we just write a little routine to see if Hasse theorem is holding. If it's false, then we'll print an abort statement that the Hasse theorem failed, let's break. But actually that's never gonna be called. So that'll be just a little more verification for us that it's true. And then what we can do is now that we have the list of all possible orders, let's print out the minimum order and the maximum order of over all possible elliptic curves and compare them to the upper and lower bounds of the Haas's theorem. Now in this last part of the code, let's just test to see that every number in the interval, we could call it Haas interval, is actually equal to the order of some elliptic curve. To do this, let's just define a list. At the beginning, it'll be empty and hopefully it's going to remain empty. We'll call that list not group orders and we're going to range for every i between the lower Hasse bound and the upper Hasse bound. And we're just gonna see if i is inside our list of group orders that we created before. If it's not, then we'll remember that and we'll append it to our list of not group orders. So basically we're just looping over, we're ranging over every integer in the interval where an elliptic curve cardinality could lie and we're just verifying to see if there's an elliptic curve with that cardinality. Now, the, there, there should, according to the theorem, every integer in that range should be the cardinality of some elliptic curve, which means not group orders should remain empty. So in this part here, we'll test if the length is zero, which means it's empty, which is what we expect. Every, we'll print out every integer in the possible range is a group order. And in the case where there are some curves who, there are some integers who, which, is not, which are not the cardinality of any elliptic curves, we don't think this is gonna happen, but we'll account for it anyways. In that case, we'll print out 
the following are not the orders of any elliptic curves and we'll print out whatever numbers are in the list of not group orders. Well, again, we don't expect that case to happen. And finally, why don't we just, since we have all this uh, information here, why don't we print out the average group order? And that's really easy to find. We just add up all the integers inside group orders and then divide by its length. And although I didn't mention it, this number is actually p plus one. That'll require more discussion and let's not get into it, but let's just verify it. So when we run our code now, what do we get? Well, we see the lower house of bound is 82. We knew that from before. The minimum group order is 82. So there really is a group, uh, an elliptic curve whose order is 82. The upper house of bounds 122, we know that. There is a group, um, there is an elliptic curve, same thing, which has an order of 122 as well. And we notice the message, every integer in the possible range is a group order. So we verified that that theorem is true. And notice that the average group order is 102. And since P is 101, P plus one is 102. So again, it's not too important for our discussion moving forward, but the average of order of overall elliptic curves um, of FP is P plus one. All right, so that's a general idea on Hauss's theorem, and that's gonna be the end of this video.